you like. For anyone just coming in, there's a sign up sheet going around somewhere, and there are a couple of handouts by the door. You should each have one, one of uh, each of the two handouts. That's it. 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 Class, 
with some examples of the sorts of problems we're likely to be encountering over the course of the term. So, I think we've got a few more people still trying to come in. Uh, yeah, so we've uh, run out of chairs here. I guess there's some or we are anyone wants it. Uh, we may need to find some more. We might want to see if there's an unused classroom next door you can take some chairs from. All right, so I guess one of the things I'd like to figure out early in the class is just what mixes of expertise we have here. So usually we get a pretty wide mix of different backgrounds in this class, and I think it's one of the things that makes it an um, interesting class to teach, and that I hope makes it more of a learning experience for you guys, but it, it also can make it a bit challenging since you're coming from various different directions. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are doing a degree in computational biology? Uh, how many in biology? Uh, how many in computer science? Uh, some other kind of science, engineering of some sort. Okay, so we've got a pretty wide mix in here. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I think that this is a class that will give all of you material you haven't seen before. Uh, the way we tend to structure this, uh, we tend to start with uh, some material that's likely to be more familiar to those of you with more of a computer science background, but we get through that pretty quickly, so I think pretty soon you're all likely to be seeing quite a bit of material you haven't seen in your previous classes. So one of the things I wanted to talk about early is just my general philosophy of this, so what this class is about and what I hope you guys get out of it. So a lot of classes you would take, especially in computational biology, are going to be classes devoted to solving particular kinds of problems. So if you want to know how to build evolutionary trees, you can take a class that will teach you all the standard models and algorithms for building evolutionary trees, and the same with various other kinds of problems. And I want to emphasize that that is not what this class is about. The point of this class is really to teach you how to handle problems that no one has studied before. There isn't a good standard method to solve them. I want to teach you a very broad set of methods, a kind of bag of tricks you can use to take any sort of problem where you can't look up a standard method, figure out how to formalize that as a computational problem, know what tools you have to deal with that, and to be able to come up with at least a first pass at a good approach for solving the problem you're trying to solve. Now because of that, we're going to be focusing in this class on a lot of cross-cutting tools and methods. So things that I'm presenting, not so much because I know they're important for a particular kind of problem in biology, but because they just come up very broadly, very generally for solving a lot of kinds of problems in biology and beyond. So a lot of what we're going to be covering is learning about these general kinds of models and methods and analysis tools, and I want to focus repeatedly on the question of how we can take informal descriptions of problems, which is usually what we deal with in practice if you're doing computational biology work, and put them into the language of mathematics where we can start to work with these sorts of tools. Now, one downside of this approach is that because we're covering a pretty wide variety of methods, we can't go into great depth on any particular method. So it is a survey class, and there will be times when I'll teach one lecture on a topic that might be the subject of an entire class, that might be the subject of an entire series of classes you could take elsewhere. So we can't learn everything here, but what I hope you get is at least an understanding of the methods you would need to make a first pass at any problem, and enough knowledge to know where to look to get more advanced uh, uh, knowledge, more depth on particular topics if you need it. So that basically is what I hope you guys get out of this class. Are there any questions at this point uh, about any of that? Okay, so what I want to do next is go over some of the administrative details of the classes. And you should all by this point have uh, these two handouts. If you don't, you can circulate some more of these just for anyone who hasn't gotten them. I guess you guys can just kind of pass these around for anyone who hasn't seen them yet. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention is simply who I am and how to reach me. So I'll be holding office hours this term, Wednesdays, 9.30 to 11.
And I'll be holding office hours at my lab in the Mellon Institute, MI654. So if you need to see me at that time, just show up, just walk into the lab. Uh, I prob I'm far enough in the back that I won't hear you if you knock, so don't bother knocking, just go in. If you need to see me other times, you may or may not find me there. It's usually best to make an appointment, and email is usually going to be the easiest way to catch me. So if you need to talk to me at, at other times, just send email. And that's the, the way you're likely to get the quickest response from anything. I also will keep in my lab copies of supplementary readings, so things that I used in developing course notes for this class, as well as other kinds of reference texts you might find helpful. I, I'd ask that those not leave the lab, but if you need to refer to them, they'll be in the lab if you need them. So basically, I, I think this will be a good time for office hours because uh, unfortunately this is the first time in a number of years I've had to teach the class without a TA, and homeworks will be due Thursdays almost always, so hopefully Wednesday office hours will be helpful for you guys. All right, so the next issue is grading. So this is covered in the course information handout. So this class does not have any exams. The course grade is based 75% on homework assignments, 25% on final project. So the homework assignments will be handed out every two weeks and due two weeks after that. So there will be six assignments in total. And if you can do the math, this implies that each of the assignments is worth a pretty significant fraction of your final course grade. So just be aware that these are relatively substantial assignments and you do have to do all of them if you want, if you expect to pass the class. So I mentioned that there are several different course numbers this class is offered under. So two of these, the 512 versions, are the undergraduate numbers. Two of them, the 712s, are the graduate numbers. The difference between these is largely due to the homework assignments. So if you're in the 712 numbers, that means that you'll have extra problems on the homework assignments. Typically it's going to be more theoretically challenging problems than I, I give on the rest of the homeworks. So basically if you're in the 512 number, you'll do the first part of the assignment and then there will be typically one extra more theoretically challenging question for those of you in the graduate number. I will also just generally expect more of the final projects for those of you in the graduate number than I expect for uh, those in the undergraduate numbers. As far as the 02 versus 03, uh, that doesn't matter to me. It may matter to some other people in the administration here, but either one is the same class, 02 or 03, so you get graded on the same curve either way. I guess I should mention we'll have separate curves for undergraduate versus graduate. I will say that it, it pretty much always ends up that the undergraduates do about as well as the graduates on the common problems. There's no real advantage to being in one curve versus the other, but say, people sometimes worry about that, so I'll just say that they will be separate curves. All right, any questions on that at this point? Okay, so next topic is the homework, and there are a few things I want to say about the homework assignments. So one of the things is that the homework assignments will always have programming problems. Those will usually be, I, I think, the hardest problems on the assignments. And usually the things that are likely to take the most amount of work uh, on them. So I do have a few guidelines for uh, completing and turning in the programming assignments. So one of these is that I like to be able to give partial credit. I, I know sometimes a program almost works but doesn't quite work. And I can't give partial credit unless I can follow your source code. So I do need you to turn in your source code. And it needs to be in a language I know well enough that I can read that. So I do have to restrict it. And I've set it at this point to Java, C, C++, MATLAB, or Python. And I will warn you that I don't really know Python that well yet. But I'll, I, I figure I'll learn by the end of the term your assignments. Uh, Whatever you turn in should be turned in as a, uh, a, a complete uh, set of code. It should not depend on any third-party library. I shouldn't have to download anything that isn't part of a standard implementation of the language to use it. 
and I'd like you to turn in all of your files in a single archive, so zip or tgz, through Blackboard. And this is just important so I know everything is in one place and I'm not trying to remember, you know, one person emailed an assignment, another person gave me a USB drive or whatever. So please use Blackboard to turn in all of your programming assignments as one archive per person. For the question and answer parts of the assignments, you can either turn those in in class on paper or turn those in as a, a PDF or the something equivalent on Blackboard with your programming uh, code. Right, any questions about any of that? Yeah. Um, is there any chance you could add R to that list of source code? Uh, it's a really cute language. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, R is also on my list to learn better, but I. I, I I, I think one language at a time is my <laughs> limit, so I'm going to have to say these ones specifically. But if you know R, MATLAB is very similar, and I recommend learning MATLAB anyway for this class. It's, for some of the assignments, MATLAB is by far the easiest thing to write them in. So I'd, I'd say if you know R, learn MATLAB, and you'll be in good shape for that. Any other questions? Okay, so next issue is uh, due dates. So each of the assignments, as I mentioned, is going to be handed out once every two weeks. They'll be due the following two weeks. I, I think we might have one exception for Thanksgiving week where it'll be due two days early. But whatever date is listed as the due date, the assignment is due as of that date. And I will say that I am strict on the due dates. I don't want things to start slipping and then I have to worry about you know, who's turned in their assignments for a given week, who hasn't. So my rule for this is that I pretty much don't make exceptions. It really has to be a very special case, like you suddenly ended up in the hospital two days before it was due and you just didn't have a chance to work on it. And in those cases, I'll ask to see a, a doctor's note. But otherwise, the assignment's due the day it's due. I know sometimes something comes up. Uh, and I will accept things up to a few days late, but with a 10% penalty for each day late. So it's due as of class time on the date listed on the due date. From that time until the next day, it's 10% off. From that time until the next day, it's 10% off. And the 10% off applies to the entire assignment as of the last piece you turn in to me. So in other words, I don't want you turning in the written part and saying you didn't finish the program and you'll give me that the next day. If you do that, then the whole thing is 10% off. So just either turn in what you have as of the day it's due or turn in you know, everything a day late for 10% off everything. Okay, uh, is that clear to everyone? All right, so, and then just one caveat on that, the absolute limit is one week late. So if after one week, there's no credit on the, the assignment. So you have two weeks to do these. I promise you, you do not need two weeks to do these. So if you plan ahead, start them early. This should never be an issue for you. If you know you're going to be traveling the day the assignment is due, then just do it early and get it into me early and that will be fine. Now at the same time, you don't need two weeks to do these, but do not expect to be able to finish the assignment if you wait until the night before it's due. You definitely need more than one night to finish these. So just plan ahead, and I think you'll, you'll get an idea of how long you, you need to work on these. All right, so the next issue is the final projects. So final projects can be done either individually or as a group. I usually recommend that you do these with groups, so I, I think typically three or four people is a good group for an assignment. So when these are, are done, you'll be turning in one uh, written report and doing one oral presentation per group. And as I mentioned, usually we lose some people in the first couple of weeks, but if the class stays close to this size, I'll probably need to insist that you group up quite a bit because we have to get through presentations for everyone in the last week of class. So we, there's a limit to how many presentations we can accommodate. So normally I think it's best if you guys come up with your own ideas for projects or something you're interested in or something you're working on, a research project. But I, I can suggest ideas if you want them. Uh, usually around the middle of the term, I'll start giving you more specific guidelines for final projects. And I would normally expect that you'll spend roughly the last month of the class working on these. And then the final week of class will be devoted to project presentations. 
But any questions about that? Okay, so the next issue is collaboration. Uh, so for any of you who are new to Carnegie Mellon, you should be aware that academic honesty is allowed and not allowed collaboration in any class you're taking. In this class, I encourage you guys to work together on your assignments. So it's great if you guys have study groups. Uh, if any of you wants a study group and doesn't know anyone in the class and like help with that, send me email. I'll try to match people up, so try to make sure people are, are uh, have people to work with if they want to. It's one advantage of having a class of very different kinds of expertise that pretty much all of you can learn from other people in the class, and that, again, is something I encourage you to do. But the work you turn in has to be entirely your own work. So feel free to discuss problems, talk about strategies you would use for solving them, feel free to talk about uh, algorithms you might use in your coding assignments, but whatever you write up, you have to write up on your own. Don't look at other people's written assignments. Definitely don't look at or copy from other people's code. This comes up every year as an issue with code, so I just want to make sure that the rule is very clear here. There's absolutely no cutting and pasting from each other's coding assignments. Whatever you write, you have to type in yourself. No using anything you've taken off the web. No using any third-party libraries as part of your code. So whatever you turn in has to be entirely your own. And uh, just because, I, I know I shouldn't need to say this, but every year I do, just changing the names of the variables does not qualify as making it not cutting and pasting. So please don't do that. At a minimum, if you copy someone else's work, you'll fail that assignment. And this, as I say, is something we take very seriously. So just make sure you understand what's written in this collaboration policy and follow it carefully. So any questions about that? So like, for example, if we're using Python, then we're, we want to use like a statistical package, a library, that's not allowed? Uh, well, if it's a, a standard package, basically, the, the rule of thumb I, I, I would go by is if I would have to download something that is not part of a standard release of Python to use it, then don't use it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, and the, the last thing, this is just a good guideline in general. If you use sources, and a source can be a person, a book, a web page, or whatever, beyond what we cover in class, or beyond my lectures or the course text, uh, just uh, cite what you, you use. It's just good scholarly practice in general. Okay, so the next issue I wanted to go over is the question of course content. And that you can refer to the course calendar here. I'll just give some general guidelines of what we're going to see there. So roughly the first four weeks of the class will be devoted to what I refer to as models for optimization. So any of you who have any sort of computing background are likely to have encountered optimization algorithms of one kind or another before. So in the first few lectures of the class, we're going to be going through uh, optimization. Although, uh, again, to go back to the course philosophy, I'm not so much focused on you knowing the algorithm to solve a particular kind of uh, you know, minimum spanning tree problem or whatever. I'm focused more on the question of how to pose the models, but you need to know something about what you can do to solve a model, to know what would make a good model. So we do need to go through some sorts of algorithms for common problems you're likely to encounter. We'll also be looking at continuous optimization. This is something uh, maybe fewer of you are likely to have encountered in your prior classes. And there, there are some more general purpose kinds of algorithms that we're going to be going through that you will need to know about. In the second section of the class, we'll be studying simulation and sampling. So I'll say more uh, shortly about what these kinds of topics cover, but basically covering common kinds of models and algorithms for simulating biological systems or other kinds of systems or sampling from probability distributions. 
So just as with optimization, we'll be covering a mixture of discrete uh, methods for simulation and sampling, typically what's called a Markov chain or Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, followed by continuous sampling methods, which usually comes down to some version of numerical integration, so integrating ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations, so that sort of thing. The next module of the class, which will cover uh, roughly the, the almost final four weeks, are devoted to left of the simulation sampling, will be model inference. So this is the topic of how we learn a model for one of the, these problems. So whether we're doing optimization or simulation and sampling, you're going to be working with a model that will often have some tunable parameters to it. So it will be chosen from some space of possible models. And the final topic in the class will be how we learn these models, and typically how we fit models to data sets. That will be the third topic. And then the final week of the class, as I mentioned, is going to be devoted to you guys presenting and talking about your final project. So, any questions about that? Yeah. Um, I don't have a textbook yet, but would you be possible? Would it be possible if you posted some of the like a scan of the like chapter one or two? Uh, yeah. I, option. Um. Uh, so maybe a, a, it's a lot of pages, and it's fine. But I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can probably. Uh, well, I, I should talk to you offline about it. There may be copyright issues with that that makes it a problem to post uh, uh, materials like that. But I, I you know, we, we should be able to work uh, something out about that. So I, I, uh, I'll see what I can do there. And when it says reading chapter one, that's like, I'm supposed to read that for next class. So I wasn't supposed to read chapter one for this class. Um, well, generally what's listed on the calendar is going to be what you should read to understand that lecture. So okay. ideally, uh, I, I know none of you have read chapter one before this class, but uh, you know, that one is fine to read afterwards. But in, in general, I think you'll get the most out of lectures if you read the chapter that's referred to there in advance. Right, so I, right, so I will say the textbook for this class, uh, you might notice, is written by me. That's because it was based on the lecture notes that I developed in developing this class. So the first few times I taught this class, I did give out uh, handwritten lecture notes, and no one liked having handwritten lecture notes because you couldn't read them. So then I latex them up, and uh, that was a little better. But uh, I finally decided it would be easier for everyone if you could just get the complete lecture notes package in a textbook rather than having to make lots of copies of that and pass them around. So that is the, the text for the class. Now, I think that is generally a good thing for us because it means the text very closely follows what you need to know for the class. But you might notice it's a few years out of date at this point, so I revise the material as we go. I'll be presenting uh, certainly material in lecture that isn't in the textbook. There are a number of new lectures I've created since that came out, and a number of revisions I've made to the specific lectures there. So. Uh, this is something where I will say, I, I think you really will benefit from having this text. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I used to try to uh, give you guys back the portion of the price of this that actually went to me. It's really not a lot of money, but uh, I could never get anyone to take the money. So I, in the end, what I started doing a couple of years ago is I just uh, figure out how much I would get from you guys buying these and just give a donation to charity for that amount. So if anyone wants to suggest a charity, go ahead. I, past few years I've been giving something to donors choose, just you know, give to um, high school education in the area or something, but you know, feel free to make suggestions for that. Okay, but basically I do think the textbook is a really useful thing for you guys to have, so I would recommend you guys get a, a hold of that one way or another. All right, so any questions about any of that? Okay, so that then brings me to uh, one more bit of administrative material I wanted to discuss before we get on to kind of uh, the technical meat of the class and talking in a bit more detail about what, about what I mean about these particular things. And that is just some general advice I like to give each year about 
how to succeed in this class. So I will be honest with you guys that this class is an appreciable amount of work. You guys should expect to uh, do a fair amount of work if you want to succeed in this class. But I don't think it's hard to succeed if you follow the advice I'm giving here. And it's relatively simple advice. So the first piece of advice is come to lecture. So aside from the sign-up sheet today, I'm not going to be taking attendance. If you need to miss a class, you don't need to tell me about that. So it's not going to directly affect your grade. But I will say that I think you get a lot out of lecture that you're not going to get just out of reading the textbooks. So I do strongly recommend you actually come to the class. As I mentioned, I revised the material quite a bit relative to what's in the textbook. You're going to get uh, typically new examples beyond what's in the textbook, sometimes new topics that I uh, hadn't been covering as of a few years ago. So I do think it's really important. And also it's just a chance to ask questions or hear what questions your classmates are asking that might not have occurred to you. So if you want to do well, I strongly recommend you come to lecture. Second thing is do all of the homeworks. So there are six homework assignments, there's 75% of the grades, so you guys can do the math. You cannot afford to miss a single assignment and do well in this class. I know people always ask each year if I can just waive one assignment, and I think since each is covering a two-week block of the class, you, you're really missing a pretty appreciable part of the class if you don't do all of them. So I really do want you to do all of them, and you have to do all of them if you want to do well in the class. So. Just as I mentioned before, you have two weeks to do each one. You don't need two weeks to do them, so just plan ahead, and it should not be hard to complete all of the assignments. And if you don't do this, you're pretty much guaranteed not to get a good grade in the class. Third thing is get your assignments in on time. You might think that the 10% penalty that I give is not such a big deal, and if it's a one-time thing, it's not that big a deal, so one-time 10% penalty on one of the six assignments, but those add up very quickly, and if you start letting things slip by a few days on one assignment, or a day on every assignment, or something like that, it adds up very quickly. So that is one of the most consistent things that will lead to a bad grade or a failure in this class, is letting the deadline slip. So just don't do that. Or just get these done on time and we'll do a lot better. And finally, make an attempt on every problem So I think I'm pretty generous with partial credit in this class, but you have to give me something to work with for me to give you any partial credit. So I know some of the problems are hard. You, you might not get your programs working. For those of you in the grad version, I may ask you to do a proof, and you might not be able to figure out the proof, but turn in what you, you have. And I will at least try to give credit for uh, partial work towards the correct answer, even if you don't get all the way there. So this, again, is something where you can start losing credit pretty quickly if you're leaving out large parts of the assignment because you didn't get to finish everything. So please make an attempt on each problem and turn in what you have. Now, I will say on this that doesn't mean that I want you to turn in complete gibberish if you just have no idea what to do. If you really are sure that you have no idea what to do on a problem, first of all, ask me about that in advance. So you know, come to office hours or something, and hopefully I can get you on the right track. But if it really comes due to the deadline and you have no idea, you know, don't turn in just something that has nothing to do with the solution. But if you think you're maybe on the right track, turn it in. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so 
That basically is my advice. I think if you follow these four pieces of advice, you're, you'll all do well in this class. All right, so that kind of wraps up the administrative part of what I wanted to talk about. And then the rest of what I wanted to do is, to, in terms of giving an introductory lecture today, is to try to go through, in general, what I mean by these different pieces of the class. So what I mean by models for optimization, by simulation and sampling, by model inference, by just giving some brief examples of what I'm talking about with these areas, and then walk through some slightly longer, kind of simple, uh, uh, little case studies of what problems in those different areas might look like. Okay, so let's start with the question of a model for an optimization problem. You've probably all encountered examples of this in one context or another. And one example that any of you with the, something of a computational biology or bioinformatics background have probably seen would be the question of sequence similarity. So that is a common kind of optimization problem you would look at in a bioinformatics context. So maybe we've got a couple of amino acid sequences. we might be interested in the question of how are these two amino acid sequences, or how similar are these two amino acid sequences to one another. So can anyone tell me how we would usually uh, solve that question? What would be a standard method to do that? <coughs> points for matches, minus points for mismatches and gaps. And uh, yeah, so a typical way we would do this is we would have some sort of scoring function that would tell us how good it is to match up a G with a G, or a G with an A, or an H with an R. And then we would do a sequence alignment. We would try to find the optimal way of lining up these pairs of sequences. And uh, I don't know if you'll throw some gaps in here. And we would come up with some score that would tell us how similar these sequences are. So that would be an example of, a, of a, an optimization problem we would solve in modeling. In this class, I'm going to be more concerned with the question of why we would use that kind of model, or how we might pose a model like that, or how you might modify that model. So you do need to know a bit about the algorithms that go into this, so what kinds of algorithms would let you do an alignment, because that would let you start to ask questions like, would we be able to handle this if what we were doing was a slightly different sort of alignment? So would you be able to use those algorithms if you were aligning pairs of nucleotide or pairs of amino acids instead of aligning single amino acids, or if we allowed more complicated kinds of gap functions? But basically, this would be an example of a simple alignment problem, and we'll want to be able to consider why we might use that particular model, how we might learn the uh, weight functions between different amino acids, and so forth. An example of a simulation and sampling problem might be the following. So in a simulation and sampling problem, maybe we're interested in modeling a reaction network. You can take a very simple reaction network described by, let's say, a simple reversible reaction. A plus B goes to C. So maybe we've got a molecule A and another molecule B, and those join together to form a complex C, and they, these complexes can break apart. And we might be interested in trying to figure out what happens when you put a certain amount of A and a certain amount of B and a certain amount of C into your system. And maybe we would observe that you know, the A kind of drains away, and the C drains away, and, or B drains away, and the C increases. We'd like to be able to model a process like that to understand the behavior of that system. In a situation like this, there are, again, some standard sorts of models people tend to use. And the simplest version of this you'll commonly see, which we'll look at a bit later in the class, is what's called a mass action model, where we would represent something like this as a system of differential equations. So we would say that we have some function that describes 
how A evolves versus time. Maybe that's described by some rate constant K1 times C minus another rate constant K2 times the concentrations of A and B. And likewise, we could get equations for the other species. dB dt is K1C minus K2AB. dC dt is minus K1C plus K2AB, and so forth. And then what we'll be interested in is how we would pose a model like this, what alternatives we might have available to consider, what assumptions we're making in a, using a model like this, as well as what algorithm algorithm versus another to take a description of the model we're working with and come up with a simulation of the behavior of that sort of model. So any questions? All right, so a model inference problem then would be a problem in which we're trying to figure out the correct model to use for a particular system like this. And we can use this simulation sampling model as an illustration of what a model inference problem might look like. So can anyone tell me for this mass action model here, what are the tunable parameters of that model? Yeah, so in this case, this model has two parameters, rate constants of different reactions. And an example of a model inference problem might be to find K1 and K2 for this simulation and sampling system. So maybe we're trying to find those rate constants. And usually, if we wanted to do this, we would have to assume that we have some data available to us to learn the parameters of the model we're trying to learn. So it might be that we have some curves available where maybe we know A, B, and C at some set of discrete time points. We've got some T0, T1, T2, and so forth. We're going to assume that we know each of these species at each of these time points, and so on. And what we'd like to do is figure out the right K1 and K2 to describe the experimental data we have available. For a problem like this, there are again some standard sorts of techniques people tend to use. A typical way of doing this might be to pose the problem in terms of minimizing, let's say, root mean square deviation between the model and the experimental data. So in this case, we have a specification of a model we might use, and we can say that if we are given our real data, which we can think of as a function a of t, a function b of t, a function c of t, then we can describe the behavior of our model, let's call that a hat, as a function of both time and our choices of parameters. And we can do the same with a b hat of t, k1, k2, c hat of t, k1, k2. And then we can pose some problem that has as its solution the optimal choice of parameters to fit the model to the data. And if, if we were doing this with a root mean square deviation model, that would typically look something like the following. If we have time points t1 to tn, what we would try to do is minimize over choices of k1 and k2 an objective function that looks something like the following, sum i equals 1 to n of, let's say, a of ti minus a hat of ti, k1, k2 squared plus b of ti minus b hat of ti, k1, k2 squared plus same thing for C, C of Ti minus C hat of Ti, K1, K2 squared. And then we can pose the problem of trying to find the K1 and K2 that minimize this function here. So that would be an example of a model inference problem that we might be interested in solving here and give us a way of figuring out the right parameters for fitting our model from the simulation sampling problem to the experimental data we have available. All right, so questions about that? Okay, so that's kind
kind of a quick overview of these three areas. And what I want to do then is walk through an, a slightly more involved example of each of these kinds of problems to see some of the sorts of reasoning that we'll be using as we get into the, the class. Right, so to jump back to the question of the model for optimization, what I'm going to do is pose a simple sort of modeling uh, optimization problem that we might be interested in, something that comes up quite a lot in the biological context. And that is the problem of inferring a set of evolutionary relationships. So let's suppose that we're given a set of organisms. So maybe we've got a human, a chimpanzee, a cow, chicken, say a zebrafish, and maybe an anemone. And we want to know how these organisms are related to one another. So that may seem like a relatively simple question. I've given you the organisms and asked you how they're related to one another. But a question like that hides a lot of ambiguity. There are a lot of different ways we can answer that question. And the key to a class like this and to coming up with a computational method is that we need to be much more precise about what we're asking here. And a lot of what we'll be trying to do as we go through this class is to get a better understanding of what it means to be precise and how we can formalize a statement like this, a question like how these things are related to one another in a way that will make it amenable to computational analysis. All right, so what would be an example of an answer to this problem? If someone asked you this question, what might your answer to it look like? And then she was going to say humans, chimps, cows, are all, and zebras are all mammals, and then chickens are birds, and maybe, or whatever the last one is, is like a, what is that, bacteria? Uh, well, yeah, I guess it's a, well, well an invertebrate, I guess, but uh, yeah, so I, we can group them in different ways hierarchically. We can say, you know, these are mammals, it's a bird, a fish, an invertebrate. Uh, oh, yeah, it's a, sorry. Zebra fish. All right, so that would be one way of doing this. But then, of course, there are different levels of resolution we could use for that kind of our hierarchy. We could group them into the vertebrates versus the invertebrates, or we could group them in various other ways. Can anyone think of another way we could answer this? We could look at the gene that's shared amongst them and then score that and build a tree based on the amount of change. Yeah, so there are, you could take some piece of information about each of these and try to build a tree that would tell you how these are related to one another. That's a very common way of representing this sort of inference. You could say that maybe there's some kind of evolutionary tree that relates them. And even that is something that would hide quite a lot of ambiguity. There are a lot of assumptions we make in specifying that, let's say, a tree is the answer we want that we need to kind of resolve if we're going to come up with a precise computational method to solve this. So let's say we declare that our answer to this question is going to be a tree. What assumptions are we making in saying that the answer is a tree? One common ancestor? Yeah, so we might be assuming that there is a single common ancestor. So we would usually think that if you look at all the organisms on Earth, there's probably a common ancestor if you go back far enough. But uh, that is an assumption that we would have to make if we want to say that there is a, a tree there. Can anyone think of any other assumptions we're making here? There's some degree of measurable variability. Yeah, so we'd have to assume that there is some basis for separating the different organisms in this uh, kind of tree. Okay. Um, whatever gene that you pick, also, you have to assume that it represents the vertical line of descent for these, um, rather than having some sort of alternate deviance. Yeah, so a tree is a, a fairly restrictive model in the sense that different parts of the genome might actually have different trees assigned to them. 
And if we restrict our answer to one tree, we're throwing out that kind of ambiguity that maybe in some parts of the genome, we might be have a different evolutionary distance between these two organisms than in other parts of the genome. For example, there's some relatively recent work on human and chimp DNA, which suggests that we've had kind of a complicated evolutionary history, where we had a common ancestor that split apart into two groups, and then at some point, those two groups kind of back crossed and made it again, and modern humans actually came from this lineage that has two different ages of separation from chimpanzees. So that's a more complicated kind of non-tree-like relationship that is lost if we use the tree representation. But at some point, we have to come up with a representation and declare that that is the kind of answer we're going to insist on in this problem. And so what I'm going to say is that our answer is going to be a tree, which we typically represent as a vertex set and an edge set. So the vertices are all these points joining the edges together. And then the edge set E is the set of edges telling us which points are joined. And I'll go further and say that this is an unweighted tree. So that is another bit of ambiguity. In some trees, we care about how long the edges are. And that may have different sorts of interpretations depending on what we care about here. But for now, I'll just say that our tree is an unweighted tree that connects our organisms. And there's more I can say and more detail I can give in, but for the purposes of this class, let's just say that that is what our answer looks like. And this illustrates an important point in modeling because it's giving one piece of a formal specification of the problem, and that is an output format. So we've specified at this point what the general form of output to our problem looks like. It's going to be a tree, and again, there's more detail, so it's specifically going to be a tree where the leaves are labeled with our organisms. All right, so just as we need to specify an output format, there's another important piece that we're going to need if we want to formally specify a problem, and that is the question of an input format. So we're going to need to formally say what the input to our problem looks like. And this comes down to the question of that saying, we have a version of uh, our, what our output would look like, a universe of possible outputs, but now we need to know which output from that universe is the right one. And that, for a biological problem, is usually going to come down to asking which one is most consistent with a particular set of evidence, and that evidence will be our input. So we heard for one example of what evidence might look like for a problem like this. We might take a particular gene and we might use the sequence of that gene as the evidence we'll use to build our evolutionary tree. Can anyone think of other information we might use, alternative inputs we might consider here? Um, color of the exterior? Yeah, so it, Back in the days when genomic sequence was hard to come by, people would commonly use what were called morphological traits or character traits of one kind or another, which basically were things you could tell by looking at an organism. So you could ask what color the organism is. You could ask, does it have fur or feathers or scales? You could ask, uh, does it walk on two legs or four legs or no legs? So those would be examples of morphological traits. And, those were used quite a bit before it was easy to get DNA sequence, and they're, they're still important in some contexts in evolutionary tree studies. Can anyone think of why we might still want to use these in some cases? If you want to look at extinct species? Yeah, so if you want to figure out how dinosaurs are related to one another, usually you're not going to be able to get dinosaur DNA, so you could go based on morphological traits you can figure out. And so for our purposes for now, what I'm going to say is, let's suppose that we are using genetic data. And let's suppose that we've taken one particular piece of the genome. So we'll imagine that we take one well-conserved piece of genome that's found in all of these organisms in a single copy. And I will further declare that this particular piece of sequence, we've taken a few bases and we've aligned them to one another. So all of those kinds of things are issues about specifying the input format that may affect the tree we end up with. 
But if we imagine that we can do that, then we may get an input that looks something like the following. So maybe we get this sequence for our human, and uh, maybe this sequence for our chimp, and maybe we've got a gap in the alignment for our cow sequence or whatever. But one way or another, we're going to get a set of sequences. In general, we'll assume that maybe we have m sequences, and they each have a length of n, and this is going to give us a way of precisely specifying what our input looks like. We will say that our input is a set of m strings from an alphabet, a, c, g, t, or a dash. And we can, let's say, call this sigma. And then we can say that what we're trying to solve, I'll use the following notation, is sigma to the n. So we're trying to take an input of sigma to the n, which just means n characters from this alphabet of five possible characters. So that then would give us a precise specification of the input format that we're assuming we will use to solve this problem. Any questions about that? Okay, so normally when we are formally specifying a problem, two of the key pieces are going to be the input format and the output format. And then there's one more piece to formally specifying a problem that is a little trickier to get a handle on. And that is essentially the thing that tells us the mapping from inputs to, to outputs. So the thing that tells us for any given input, how good is any given output? And that is commonly referred to as an objective function. So the objective function is simply a measure of goodness of possible outputs for any given input. And that is the third thing we can consider in formally specifying this particular problem. And just as when we consider what our input format is, would be our output format, we will want to refer to what we know about our biological system if we're going to come up with a good objective function for our problem. So we want to start asking, what do we know about the system we're trying to study? What sorts of assumptions are we going to make about this to make this something we can work with computationally? So real biology is always very complicated and very messy, and there are always exceptions to any rule you come up with. But for computation, you have to be precise. So you have to kind of remove some of the details and figure out which details you can get away with removing. And so we might make some assumptions about our problem that are not necessarily 100% correct, but are things that allow us to balance the realism of the problem against the, uh, the tractability of it computationally. So for example, we might assume that sequences evolve only by point mutations. So what that means is that we're assuming that there is a model of evolution where one sequence or one organism turns into another by flipping single bases at a time. And if we make that assumption, then that's going to re restrict our model of evolution quite a bit. It's not a completely correct assumption, but it may be a reasonable assumption if we want to get something we can work with. We may also assume that mutations are rare. Now, if we really wanted to be precise, we would need to be more rigorous about what we mean about mutations being rare. But in some probabilistic sense, we would say that at mo over most generations, you're going to have zero mutations. Or, or to be a bit more precise, if we look at different possible evolutionary models, models that have fewer mutations are better than models that have more mutations. So can anyone tell me what the name is of a, an evolutionary model that uh, makes that assumption? Have any of you seen this in any other classes? That's commonly referred to as a parsimony model. So basically a model that says that a simpler model is a better one, as though a parsimony model is a very common thing to do in evolutionary modeling. We might also make the assumption that mutations are all equally likely. 
that's probably not entirely true, but in the absence of other information, it might be a fair assumption to make that will allow us to formally specify our problem more precisely. And if we come up with a set of assumptions like this, then that gives us a basis from which we can propose an objective function for solving our problem. In particular, what we might say is that if we have a set of sequences, let's say GCC and ACDG and GTG, then we might say that the quality of a tree for connecting these sequences will be given by the number of mutations you need across the edges of the tree to turn all the sequences into one another. So we can say, for example, that if we have GCC here and ACG here, then maybe the ancestor of these looked like from here to here. And we can refer to that one mutation as what's called an edit distance from GCC to GCG. We would say the edit distance is one. And likewise, the edit distance from GCG to ACG is one. Maybe we would say that the common ancestor of these was also GCG, and then we would need an edit distance of one here. And we could then say that the quality of the tree is determined by the sum of the edit distances along all of the edges in the tree. And that would give us a way of precisely specifying an objective function. We rate the goodness of a tree by this quality function, by this sum of edit distances, and then the best tree is the tree that minimizes the edit distance. And so, any questions about that? Right, so, if we really wanted to turn this into a formal specification of a problem, then we would want to be a bit more precise mathematically than what I've said so far, but I'll try to take the pieces we put together here and summarize them as a formal specification of the whole problem. So, we have an input, and we are going to say that this input consists of a set, let's say S, of sequences S1 through Sn, where each Si is drawn from the set ACGT dash to the N. So that is a formal specification of our input. We have an output format. This is a little more complicated. So our output is going to be a tree consisting of a vertex set and an edge set. To a bit more precisely describe this, I'm going to declare that there is also a leaf set L subset of V. So this is the set of leaf nodes of the tree. So those would be the things at the bottom of the tree. And we'll say that the size of L is M, so we're going to have one leaf for each of our input sequences. And we're going to say that there is a way of mapping nodes of the tree to strings from this alphabet. So we're going to declare that we have what I will write here in this format, t colon e arrow sigma to the n. So this is read mathematically as we have a function t from the vertex set to the set sigma to the n, where this thing here is C. And finally, we are going to say that for all S and S, there exists an L in L such that T of L equals S. Can anyone tell me in plain English what I just said in this last part here? So I'm just saying here that our function of mapping nodes of the tree to strings must map each of the leaf sequences to one of our input strings. So it's a way of saying that the leaves of the tree are labeled with our input sequences. So in this class, I'll use a fair amount of this notation. I'll try to say in, in English what the notation means as I write it. So I, I think probably most of you or many of you have probably seen these things like 
the upside down A and the backward Z. I'll try to say in English what these are, and I know you probably haven't all seen these, and just standard abbreviations like S period, T period, means such that. It's something you commonly see, commonly see in these statements, and I think you, you'll all pick up this kind of notation for long. All right, so the final thing we have then is an objective function, and I mentioned the objective before. We can say that the objective is to minimize over trees and these assignment functions, the sum over u, v, and e. So this is over edges from u to v in the edge set of the tree of the distance between the label of node u and the label of node v. So in other words, this is just a way of formally specifying what I said before. Our objective is to find the tree that minimizes the lengths of the edit distances. And that implies that we also need to optimize over the labeling of internal nodes in the tree. So that then would take our very informal question of how these organisms are related to one another and turn it into a formal mathematical problem that we can then solve computationally. I haven't mentioned yet how you would solve this. We'll see later in the class methods you could use to solve something like this, but that at least is what I mean by modeling a problem and formally specifying a problem. So any questions about any of that? Okay, so the other pieces of the class we won't be considering for a, a, a few well, at least a month at this point now. So I'll more briefly walk you through a couple of examples of problems from simulation and sampling and model inference. So an example of a simulation and sampling problem we might look at might be the question of understanding the stability of a protein sequence. So maybe we have a protein we've isolated from people that uh, catalyzes some important enzymatic reaction. And we want to transfer that protein into bacteria so that it can produce that reaction on a large scale. But we discover that there's a problem. This protein has some nice folded form that we'll call F, but it's not very stable. So it frequently unfolds into an unfolded form we'll call U, and maybe there's some transition back and forth. But the protein is only functional when it's in form F. And what we would like to do is modify this protein. So do some protein engineering so that it stays in the form F that's active a larger percentage of the time. So this might be a problem we would pose through a simulation model. We might want to come up with a simulation of this folding and unfolding process, and then use that to see how different changes in the protein might stabilize or destabilize it. So if we were really solving this in practice, there are some fairly complicated models. I think we'll see a bit later in the term an example of one of these more complicated models. But for now, what I'm going to do is propose that we can solve this with a relatively simple kind of model people sometimes use in these protein folding studies. And that's something called a lattice model. So in a lattice model, what we would do is describe the structure of a protein by simplifying it at, and treating it as a set of points on a regular grid. So just as in a an optimization problem, we would have to start by knowing what our input is. And typically for a problem like this, our input is going to be an amino acid sequence. So maybe we've got the input S in some set, and I will call this S drawn from sigma plus. This plus here means one or more copies from the alphabet sigma, and here sigma will be a different sigma than we saw in the previous problems. This would be, let's say, a set of amino acid codes. So A now would stand for alanine, and C for cysteine, and D for aspartate, and so forth. So that then would give us an input. And in a lattice model, we can take our input sequence, whatever it is, and represent that as a path on a grid. So we could say that maybe 
first amino acid is an M, a methionine, followed by a serine, followed by an arginine, followed by a lysine, a leucine, and so forth. And this then might give us a hypothetical fold of our amino acid sequence on the lattice. Now this 2D lattice is a very simplified model. It's much too simple to really study what any real protein would be looking like. There are much more sophisticated lattices and off-lattice techniques where you just get rid of this altogether. But for our purposes for now, let's just say this is our model. And what we would like to do is ask, okay, what can we do to this protein to make it stay in this folded form? And let's just say hypothetically this is a folded form a larger percentage of the time. Now just having a structure model isn't quite enough for us to ask this question in any rigorous sense. We would also need some model of energetics. So we need some way of knowing if this is a good fold or a stable fold. And in a lattice model, that would commonly be done through something called a contact potential. And a contact potential is just a way of saying how good energetically a particular fold is based on which amino acids it puts near one another. You generally ignore ones that are adjacent in the chain, but look for other ones like this S and L here, or the K and D here, that are close together in space or adjacent on the lattice, but not adjacent in the chain. And with the contact potential, you would commonly just look up in a table and you would see that S to L contacts have some energy assigned to them. So on average, these give you, let's say, plus one kilocalories per mole of energy. Now, plus one kilocalories per mole would mean that this is an unfavorable contact. Positive energies generally mean unfavorable. So maybe S's don't like to be next to L's. But K's maybe really like to be next to D's, so maybe that has an energy of minus 2 kilocalories per mole. And so we could say this has a net energy of minus 1 kilocalories per mole. And we could then ask the problem of how would we change this sequence to improve that energy. Now one obvious answer you could give is, why don't we just see which pair of residues give the best contact energy? So maybe C to C contacts are really good. And just find all the things that are together in the native state, replace those with pairs of Cs, and then we're done. What's wrong with that solution? Why might that not be a good answer? Well, the problem is, if these chains are shifting their shape over time, then even though that may be stabilizing this particular shape, it also might be stabilizing other shapes we don't want. So you can't just make changes that make this particular shape energetically stable. We need to make it energetically stable relative to all the other shapes this can take on. And that's where we would commonly need to move from a static model of the shape like this to a dynamic model that lets us study how this would change over time. So to do that in a lattice model, you would typically need to pose some model of dynamics, commonly described in terms of a move set, which is basically a set of operations we can perform on this shape to turn it into other shapes. So we might say that anywhere we've got, let's say, three amino acids, x, y, and z in the chain, we are allowed to change that to something where it's bent to put a 90 degree angle there, or bent in the other way. So. Or we can change these two to one another. So we can say that we will allow those kinds of moves, and then we can take the static model and refer to it as a dynamic model where we can look over time, over a series of discrete moves, at how this protein might change its position on the lattice. That doesn't quite get us to a simulation model yet, though, because it doesn't tell us which moves we should pick at any given time. And for this class of discrete model, what's known as a Markov chain, Monte Carlo model, 
you would typically have some sort of random operation that tells you at any given point in time, among all of the possible moves, how likely is any given move. In this particular case, we would probably use a kind of algorithm known as a metropolis model that we'll cover a bit later in the class. It gives us a particular uh, way of picking this, so a particular set of operations, a particular set of uh, a particular algorithm we can execute that lets us take the chain in any given form, consider possible moves, pick one with the right probability distribution, and then have a next state, and then just keep doing that until we get a model of the dynamics of how this chain might shift over time. And once we do that, then we would have a platform we could use to get back to our question of stabilizing the protein. So we could take our metropolis simulation, we can run our chain in its natural form, see how often it is in the native state, this folded state, and we can try changing some amino acids, see if that change then led to simulations that cause it to spend more time in this state or less time, and apply other kinds of optimization to find the optimal sequence for keeping this state stable. So that would be an example of something we might do with simulation and sampling. Right, any questions about that? All right, so later in the class we'll be seeing in a lot more detail how we would go through that kind of question to try to figure out what are the right models to pose this with and to try to balance realism of our simulation models against tractability, and tractability can mean both computational tractability and theoretical tractability. So having a model that will get you your answer in a small number of moves, for example, or will get you an answer with high reliability, and balancing that against having a realistic model where the answer will be something that actually reflects the biological system. So just very briefly, an example of a model inference problem I'll give might be the question of learning the behavior of a particular enzyme. So here maybe we're trying to study uh, what we would do to get an enzyme to be in a stable state. Maybe what this enzyme actually does is the following. Maybe this enzyme is what's called a protease. And a protease is just a protein that cuts other proteins. So you give it access to another protein, and maybe it breaks it into a few little pieces. And proteases commonly have very high specificity. So that is, they will cut the same proteins in the same places over and over, based on some notion of what these proteases are recognizing in the sequence. Typically, the way this would work is that the protease physically docks on top of the protein, and it has some sort of specificity for recognizing particular amino acid sequences in that protein and cutting if it finds the sequence it recognizes. And an example of a model inference problem we might be interested in is trying to learn the specificity of a protease. So maybe we are given a set of sequences, SI, BB, AK, SA, SK, and we're told that this is cut as follows. So maybe it cuts after the K here, if, if you present that to the protease. And maybe another sequence, HEP, CP, EGCH, SGC, CAK, TC. Maybe if it's presented with this, it cuts after the H and let's see, after the K here. And we might want to know, from looking at these examples, what is a model of the specificity of this protease. Just as with the other systems we looked at, we would have to start by formalizing what we're asking here. We would know that we are trying to develop a model that has an input and an output. And in this case, we might say that our input is going to be the set of sequences that we're learning from. So our input would be, let's say, a, some sigma star, and that means zero or more characters from an alphabet sigma, where we'll say that sigma is going to be the alphabet of amino acid sequences, or amino acids, and then we'll just add one extra symbol that means a kind of line break. So it means that you move to a new sequence. 
and that would give us a way of representing a set of amino acid sequences as one string, and our output then would be a set of cut sites. So something telling us if you give this particular input to the protease, what outputs does it get? Where does it cut? And we could formally represent that by saying that we have a set of natural numbers, so this kind of fancy n with a plus means positive integers, and then we'll put a star there, so there are one or more cut sites in our sequence, and that would give a specification of an input-output relationship for this protease. And then what we would want to do is learn a model of that specification for this particular protease for which we've been given uh, a set of known inputs and outputs, or known as training data. Well, if we want to do that, we need to have some notion of what a model might look like here. And just as with our other kinds of models, that would often involve going back to what we know about the biology of this kind of system and asking what a plausible model of a protease might look like. Now, I mentioned that a protease commonly sits on top of an amino acid sequence, and it looks at effectively some region of the sequence. Amino acids around the cut site will be relevant to determining whether it cuts at that particular site. Now, we often would need to balance the model we're choosing against the data we have available. So it may be that very distant residues are relevant to determining whether or not we have a cut here. But in this case, we can observe that we have very sparse data. We don't have a lot to learn from, and you usually have to balance the complexity of the model you're going to learn against the amount of data you have. You have to choose a model complexity appropriate to the data available, when you have limited data, that means you need simple models. You can't learn too much. So maybe we'll propose that our model is that the protease gets to look at just one amino acid, and depending on that amino acid, it has some probability of cutting. So it has some probability of cutting, let's say, a function f. If it has an A, a probability of cutting. If it sees a C, a probability of cutting. If it sees a D, and so forth. And what we're going to want to do is learn that particular function. Now, how many parameters would we need to learn then if that were our model here? Twenty. Yeah, so we have 20 amino acids. If we were thinking of this as giving us a probability of cutting after each amino acid, that would mean that we are learning 20 real numbers. We probably don't have enough data to even learn a single position of the model like this. We, we can't really learn 20 numbers from such a small number of examples of cut sites. So in this case, we would probably have to go back to our biology and ask how we can simplify even more to get this down to a simpler model. Now, we will later in the term see some more advanced methods for uh, what is called model structure determination, where you can consider different complexities of models and automatically choose an appropriate complexity. But for now, I'll just say that maybe we need to simplify even a bit more by saying we don't get one parameter per amino acid. Maybe we get one parameter per class of amino acids. So we can say that maybe there are some hydrophobic amino acids and some polar ones. And we're just going to look at how often we're cutting after hydrophobics, how often we're cutting after folates. And maybe that's enough that we can learn a reliable model of our sequence. If we were doing that, we might have to go through these, figure out which are hydrophobic, which are polar. And we could learn a reasonable model by saying that some fraction of them well, some fraction of the time when we have a polar amino acid, we get a cut site after it. Some fraction when we have a, or excuse me, that should be, yeah, uh, hydrophobic. Well, yeah. So some fraction of the time after a polar amino acid, we get a cut site. Some fraction of the time after a hydrophobic, we get a cut site. And if you do this in the straightforward way, you get what's called a maximum likelihood estimator. So if it happened that after we had 20 examples, and out of the 20, one of those had cut after a hydrophobic. We could say our maximum likelihood estimator is that 1 20th of the time we get a cut there, and maybe it was 3 out of 20 for polar, or whatever it comes out to be. And then that would give us a model here. In this case, a, a, a 
well, it would come out slightly different than that. But that would be an example of how we might need to trade off complexity of our model against the availability of our data. We'll be seeing later in the class in much more detail how we would make those kinds of trade offs, what kinds of tools we have available for working with different kinds of models. So we're, we're out of time here, but that I hope gives you a quick overview of what to expect over the course of this class. Are there any remaining questions before we break for the day? Okay, so then on Thursday we will get into the real meat of the class and start looking at models for optimization, in particular in the context of discrete optimization and especially tractable discrete optimization. If anyone hasn't seen or signed the sign-up sheet, please sign up for you. Oh. Oh.